morning. Good morning, ACC. I am so excited to just see uh, what God is doing here at ACC. I'm just looking at this, this service right now. 8.30 was, we had an awesome crowd at 8.30. It, let me tell you, last Sunday, we had 21 first-time families at ACC. Isn't that amazing? I think that has got to be a record. We have our starting point lunch after third service today. We have 22 adults scheduled to attend that and not including their kids. I want to invite you right now, if you are in this room and you are new to ACC, maybe you've been here for a couple months and you've, you've, you're kind of at that point now where you're, you're ready to dive in. Maybe this is your first Sunday and you want to find out what ACC is all about. I want to invite you to come get a, a free lunch. We're going to give you some Kadoba, which is awesome. And it's just an hour and a half with our staff. Uh, you get to hear who we are and what we're about. And it'll help you make a decision about whether or not you want to continue to be a part of this body of Christ. All right, so don't forget about Starting Point. We'd love to have you join us. It's actually also the first step of our membership process. So if, you are, if you've been here for like 10 years, and you, or you're saying, you know what, I've never actually become a member here, but I want to do that. You want to come to Starting Point also, because you can't become a member until you've attended uh, either our 101 or our Starting Point class, okay? Um, a couple other things. Christmas, right? You, isn't that crazy that we're already promoing Christmas? We have, like, so we're in, the, we're in this Follow Me series. We have today, and then two more Follow Me's, and then we have Thanksgiving, and then we have Christmas, we are, I mean, it's seriously around the corner, and we have something really, really cool planned this year for the entire series, starting on December 3rd. We have a series called, Oh, What Fun. And here's what I'm going to tell you. You want to be here on Sunday mornings in December, because we are going to do some things up on the stage that are going to be, oh, so fun. So you want to make sure to be a part of that. Uh, on Christmas Eve, go ahead and plan ahead, okay? Christmas Eve. We're adding a fourth service you can attend on Christmas Eve. So you can come at 1 p.m., 3 p.m., 5 p.m., or 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. All right, let's dive in. We are in week four of our Follow Me series. We're looking at what it means to follow Jesus, specifically through the lens of the book of Matthew. We're walking through the first gospel of the New Testament. What does it look like when we're called to follow Jesus? What does that mean? And specifically today, the series title is a bit ominous, and it's this, A Call to Die. Now, some of you might be in this room right now thinking, all right, whoa, 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 what is going on? What's going to happen after service? What is Mac going to ask us to do? Now, listen, it's, we're going to take some time this morning and explain what a call to die means. Because here's, here's the deal. I think it's important, before you agree to follow anybody, to really count the costs, to look ahead and understand what it is you're following to, right? Otherwise, it would be a bit foolish. In fact, in Luke, I know we're studying the book of Matthew, but I, I pulled this verse out of Luke. Luke 14, 27 through 29, it says, And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you, say it with me, count the cost. In other words... We have to understand, church, what does it look like to follow Jesus? What is this going to cost you? Here's why that's important. It says, for who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. I have a real-life example of this, Okay. I have a, a best friend growing up. He was the best man in my wedding. His name is James. And when we were in high school, James decided to buy a Volkswagen Beetle, uh, a, a classic, you know, one of the old ones that needed a lot of work. And he decided he was going to buy it, and he was going to fix it, he was going to paint it, he was going to redo the upholstery, he was going to, uh, like, put a new engine parts in it, he was going to soup it up, and he was going to be really proud of this thing. And he bought it, and he parked it in his parents' garage, and where it sat for a long, long time. In fact, it became a running joke amongst his friends and I. And, and yesterday, I didn't know what the status was of James's bug. So I, I group texted all of my high school friends who were in on this, right? 
including James. And I said, hey, what is the status of James's VW Bug project? And my other friend, Eric, he texted right back and he said, ha ha, let the comedy begin. In other words, he knew that there was a whole bunch of texts that were about to come out because we, we ragged on James uh, because he bought this, this B- VW bug and he never really, I guess, counted the cost of what it was going to take and how long it was going to take and how much it was going to cost and, and all the stuff it was going to take to do this. In fact, the status, if you're wondering, he still owns the bug and it's still missing a radio, so he's not quite done yet, okay? But here's the deal. Like, we do this sometimes in our life. It, I don't want you to choose to follow. When Jesus says, follow me, what he then says is count the cost. Figure out what this is going to look like and what this is going to cost you before you agree to follow. So if we're talking about this call to die, that's a pretty big deal. And we ought to pause and today count that cost. What does this mean for me? What does this mean for my family? If we're going to follow Jesus into death, what does that look like? So let's count the cost this morning and understand that it is incredibly worth it and what it means. Let's pray together. Father, I ask right now that you would remove any and all distractions from this room. Either physical distractions, God, things that we've brought, uh, you know, mental distractions, things we've brought with us in our, in our heads. God, things that are, are just keeping us from hearing from you. I pray right now that you would open and soften every heart in this room, that we'd be able to hear a fresh word from you this morning. As we look into a passage that many of us have probably read before, I pray that you would reveal something new. And through that, God, that we would apply it and be more transformed into the likeness of your Son. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So go ahead and grab a Bible and turn with me to Matthew 27. We're going to spend some time in Matthew 27, give you a little bit of heads up while you're looking for it. Uh, those of you who are maybe new to the Bible, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. It's about three quarters of the way into the full book. So go ahead and open up about three quarters. You'll find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the Gospels. This is an account, a first hand account of the good news of the life of Jesus. And we're spending time going through Matthew's account, and 27 is where we're going to spend some time today. Before we read anything, I want to ask you a question, and I'm going to give you a heads up. I'm going to ask you this question again in the middle of my message today, and then I'm going to ask it to you again at the very end, and it's going to make more and more sense as we go, but I want you to start thinking about it now, and the question is this, which Jesus are you going to choose? We're talking about following, following Jesus specifically. The question, as you're counting the cost and figuring out what what does this mean, uh, the the question of which Jesus are you going to choose might sound a little odd right now. You might might be thinking, I didn't realize there were multiple Jesuses to choose from, or what, what do you mean? So just keep that in the back of your mind. Which Jesus are you going to choose? Let's start in Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read 11 through 14. This is where Jesus is questioned by uh, Pilate. And here's what it says. Then Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, You say so. But uh, But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not respond. Then Pilate said to him, Don't you hear how many charges they are bringing against you? But he did not answer even one accusation so that the governor was quite amazed. So let's paint the picture real fast. Jesus has already been uh, tried, if you will, and found innocent multiple times. But his accusers aren't willing to give up. So now they have him in front of Pilate. And Pilate is sitting there, and he's hearing a very riotous crowd, a crowd that is demanding his attention. And and he's trying to figure out what to do with a guy he already knows to be innocent. 
and he's hoping that because this guy has already been found innocent, that he'll start speaking up for himself, that he'll start saying, listen, I've already been found innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. I shouldn't be here. But Jesus chooses to say nothing. Now, that's really important here, this entire process where Jesus is going through uh, this right now all the way through and, and past his crucifixion. Jesus chooses is very important because at any point, he could have stopped this process dead in its tracks. He could have killed his accusers. He could have made it all stop at any moment, but he, he chooses to say nothing. And Pilate doesn't understand, so let's keep reading. We're going to go 15 to, to 26 and see that Jesus is rejected by the people. During the feast, the governor was accustomed to release one prisoner to the crowd, whomever they wanted. At that time, they had in custody a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. So after they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Let's stop right there and understand what's happening. You see, it was a custom of the time because uh, a lot of the Jewish holidays a fall, a fell, not fall, sorry, fell on a, a kind of a part on the calendar where Fridays were the day for, for crucifixions. Fridays were the days that, that, that crucifixions happened, and, and they knew as a custom that this was not a, a good, good thing. It didn't mesh well with the Jewish calendar. So as a custom, what they did was they agreed to show mercy and to kind of have a little bit of give and take that Every time, every Passover, we're going to release one criminal back to you, anyone you want. So Pilate is already trying to think through a plan. Since Jesus isn't defending himself, Pilate is trying to think of a way to help. And he's, he's, he mentions that there's this thing. And, and then he, he understands that back in, in the prison cell, there's this guy named Barabbas. Now we have to think, uh, what, what do we know about Barabbas? Matthew calls him a notorious criminal. So we know that he is well known for being a bad guy. A notorious criminal is not a good thing to be. But we look in the Gospel of Luke and we find out that he's an insurrectionist and a murderer. Okay? That takes it to a whole new ball game. Now remember, we know that there's a couple other guys in the back who are thieves because they're about to be hung on a cross next to Jesus, right? So we got two thieves and a murderer, at least, in the back. We also know from Mark, Mark calls him a rebel and a murderer. So here's the deal, Barabbas isn't a good guy. And Pilate is trying to figure out, what can I do to try to, you know, Jesus isn't speaking up for himself. He's like, I think what happened in Pilate's mind is I think he knew, because it says, I knew this was only out of envy. I knew the only reason they brought Jesus here was because Jesus had risen in power. He had risen in respect. He had risen in fame. People knew who Jesus was, and they were envious of Jesus. And because he knew that, and he probably thought in his mind, there's no way they would want me to take someone just because they're a little bit envy and kill him. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in the back, and I'm going to grab one of the criminals that I know they would least want me to free today. And they went back and they grabbed Barabbas, who likely was destined to die today, and pulled him out and said, listen, this is Barabbas, a notorious murderer, and there's Jesus. You see, he's, he's working out this plan. And then he says to everyone, he says, uh, this important phrase. He says, which one do you want me to release to you? Now get this. Again, I don't believe this is a coincidence. I don't believe in, in, in that. I, I believe that God has orchestrated this entire process. As soon as he asks the question, he says, which one of these two do you want me to release to you? He immediately gets distracted. There is a message that comes to him uh, from his wife. So he has to stop what he's doing. He asks the question. 
He basically says, listen, I'm about to, to want an answer to this question, but hold on for a minute. I have to attend to something. And the Bible tells us that he gets interrupted. Let's read about that in verses 19 through 23. It says, as he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent a message to him. Have nothing to do with that innocent man. I have suffered greatly as a result of a dream about him today. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. So here's what happens, okay? He asked the question, which one do you want me to release to you? The crowd probably hasn't thought that this was going to happen. They did not expect that they would now have a choice and that they would have to, to literally choose a notorious murderer and his sentence of death or Jesus, who they're quite envious of. And somehow, just at that moment, Pilate gets called away and they have a chance to ponder their, this question. They don't have to think of an answer on the spot. They have a chance, the Bible says. They started talking amongst themselves. What are we going to say? Pilate is about to come back and he's going to ask the same question. What is our answer? And they all agree, we want Barabbas to be freed. And we want Jesus to take his place. So, Pilate comes back. He just got this message from his wife in the verse 21. The governor asked them again, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And because they had a chance to figure out their answer, they said, Barabbas. Pilate, I'm sure, must have been shocked by this answer. And he said, uh, uh, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And they all said, crucify him. And he asked, Why? What wrong has he done? But they shouted more insistently, crucify him. This is a big deal. This is a, a huge moment in history when there is a notorious criminal Barabbas standing next to Jesus, the Savior, Messiah, and the people have a choice. And they ask for Barabbas to go free and for Jesus to die a criminal's death. Let's keep reading. Let's watch what happens as Jesus is mocked by the soldiers. Matthew 27, 27 through 31. It says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him. They put a scarlet robe around him. And after braiding a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and kneeling down before him, they mocked him, hailing king of the Jews. They spat on him and they took the staff and they struck him repeatedly on the head. Over and over and over again, they struck Jesus on the head. Verse 31, when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes back on him, and then they led him away to crucify him. There's a pastor named John MacArthur, an author also, who's, who has this to say about what likely was going through the minds of the soldiers who were tasked with this. It says, Jesus fits into the category as far as the soldiers are concerned, of a village idiot, a lunatic who in a deluded way thinks himself to be a king and whom the Jews also try to pass off as some sort of threat to Caesar. Jesus is a joke and Calvary is a comedy played out. You see, these Roman soldiers took Jesus and they mocked him. And they put a crown of thorns on him. And they flogged him. We know from history that they called that, that flogging, uh, they took a thing called a cat of nine tails. It had nine little pieces of leather with glass shards and metal and rock 
at the end of these, and they would whip someone, and they believed that if we did this 40 times, surely the person would, would die. So what they would do to show mercy and to make sure that this person was still alive to be crucified on a cross, they did what they called the lashes, 40 minus 1. They would do it 39 times. They would take a man right up to the edge of death. And then even after that is when we see now the, 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 the soldiers are putting this crown on his head and hitting him over the head again and again with a metal rod and spitting on him and mocking him. They clearly have no idea who Jesus is. And here's the, I think, the most amazing thing about this. Do you know what Jesus did while all this was happening? Nothing. He just stayed there with his mouth shut and did and said nothing. And he chose to do that. He could have chosen to do something at any moment, but he chose to do nothing. We see in Isaiah 53, verse 7, there's a prophecy about Jesus, and it says he was treated harshly and afflicted, but he did not even open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughtering block, like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not even open his mouth. If you want to know how much God hates sin, just look at the suffering of Jesus. I'm going to ask that question again. A walking point I really want you to think through. Which Jesus are you going to choose? Check this out. This is something that I had missed every time I've read this passage, and maybe you've missed it too, and I might be opening your eyes to a really cool something this morning. You know what's happening here? Is just this really, Matthew is presenting this incredibly beautiful picture in a visible way of a substitutionary interchange of one man's life for another. He's taking Barabbas on one hand, who is a notorious murderer, a sinner, a bad guy who's in jail for a good reason and is about to be punished, a punishment that he fully deserves. He's taking that guy, Barabbas, and then he's taking Jesus, an innocent man who had done nothing wrong, who did not deserve any punishment. And we see in this visual, physical way, the gospel worked out where Jesus takes the place of Barabbas. You see that? Even cooler, Pilate brings Barabbas out and he sits him next to Jesus and then he asks the crowd, which one are you going to choose? Let me show you something even cooler. Do you know that Barabbas isn't actually his name? Barabbas is a nickname. Bar, B-A-R, means son of. We know that like Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, uh, Bar Barabbas, Bar, son of, and Abba, we know, means father. He had a nickname called son of the father. That was Barabbas' nickname. Now, if we go back to the original Greek manuscripts, and we have no reason to believe this isn't true. In fact, if you look in the NET Bible that is in your, uh, many of your chairbacks, you can see his name is included in here. Do you know what Barabbas' real name is? Jesus. Pilate thinks he has this plan. He's like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get like the most notorious guy I can find. Clearly, they won't want that guy released back to them. And he goes out there and he grabs the one guy back in the back named Jesus. And he brings them out and he sits them shoulder to shoulder next to Jesus the Messiah. And he's ultimately looking at the crowd. He's saying, which Jesus do you choose? When I ask that question to you and I say, which Jesus are you going to choose? We have that same decision we get to make. 
When I was in kindergarten, there were seven Matthews in my class. And the teacher had to figure out how in the world to tell us apart, right? There were multiple Matthew L's, and it wasn't easy enough just to add our last name. But somehow, I don't remember, I think I got the name Matthew O was, was what the teacher called me. You see all throughout here that Pilate, every time he talks about Jesus, he has to put a descriptor on there. Pilate, like when he's talking about Jesus, he's saying, do you want me to release Jesus, who is the Christ? The reason why Pilate has to do this is he knows he's putting two Jesuses up in front of the people and he has to basically put a descriptor next to them so that the people know, do you want Jesus who's called Barabbas or do you want Jesus who is uh, the Messiah? Psychologists have done studies before that say that when someone is on trial for, for, for the death penalty or when, when they know that their death penalty is coming up and, and they know they're back in the day when they used to hang people, they, they would notice that weeks before the hanging, the criminals would, would rub their necks as if in some way to try to understand as they're processing what that might feel like. And they say also that people who are, are, are on death row that are about to go into uh, the gas chamber, that they, weeks before their, their day, they catch them in the middle of the night holding their breath, as if somehow to understand what it might feel like to lose your life from not being able to breathe anymore. And I believe Barabbas that morning that he woke up in his cell knowing that one of those three crosses was meant for him. I believe that uh, the Bible isn't clear about this, but I believe that Barabbas, if the other two guys were thieves, I believe that one of those crosses must have been meant for the murderer. And I believe Barabbas woke up that morning probably rubbing his wrists, trying to process mentally what is it like to have metal Stakes driven through your hands. And then Pilate brings him out. He hears the crowds yelling. He knows that this time has come and he's like a dead man walking and he gets placed shoulder to shoulder next to Jesus the Messiah. And Pilate asks, just like he's asking you and me right now, which Jesus are you going to choose? And here's what's even bigger and more important to understand. You and I, we are are Barabbas. Let that sink in for a moment. You and I are the notorious sinners. You and I are the ones, I, I like to say often, if you're not the worst sinner you know, you don't know yourself very well. We are Barabbas. Here's one really cool thing about Barabbas. I believe he's the only man in history who can say that Jesus took his physical place on that cross. Barabbas had the chains removed from his wrists and from his ankles and, and as a crowd was shouting that we choose Barabbas, Barabbas must have been stupefied and is walking thinking, seriously? And just walking down freed, not going to be at all condemned for the crimes that he had committed while the crowd had chosen to put Jesus, the Messiah, the one who is innocent on the cross in his place and that is the same choice we have. What does it mean then, this call to die. What does this call to die really mean? I think it means that you choose to follow Jesus, the Messiah, over yourself. If you are Barabbas, you have two choices to make. You have Jesus shoulder to shoulder up against yourself, and the question is, which Jesus are you going to choose? And I want to encourage you, I want to implore you, if up until this point in your life you have chosen to follow Barabbas, to follow the notorious sinner that is you and me, you're choosing the wrong Jesus. And if that's you this morning, I want to encourage you today, this morning, let's not let any more time go by with you choosing the wrong Jesus. There's three things I want to encourage you to do this morning. And the first one is this. I want you to admit that you're a sinner. I want you to admit and recognize that you are Barabbas. That's your spot in this, in this play. You, are, you play the part of the notorious criminal. Me too. 
You are a sinner. Number one, recognize that. Number two, I want you to believe that Jesus took your place. I want you to believe that, that Jesus is the one who went up on the cross that was meant for you. He died a death that you were meant to die. I want you to believe that. And finally, number three, I want you to confess it with your mouth. Don't just know it in your head. Don't just uh, like hear it and be like, yeah, I, I get it. But I want you to believe it to the point where you're willing to tell people about it and confess it with your mouth and just share it with others so they can know too. For some of you, that might mean you need to come. We're going to sing a song together. Maybe you need to come forward this morning and tell either me or someone on our prayer team, I want to choose Jesus the Messiah this morning. I want to give my life to Christ. Come on up here, brother. Get up here. I was in jail this morning. That's why I did my short papers. Woman, I love Rob Holland, but I put it in God's hands. She said, if you mean that, do it. I've done it. I made a video of kicking the methadone and heroin programs. I watched everything on television. There's a solution, and it's the Bible. It's the only way we're going to work out and make it. Here's papers. A baby standing around the only way. Two people to shout off your money. I know that I need money to cost this. Go without and love him and do what he says and speak from your heart and soul. Thank you all for having me. I love you to your stomach for crying and feeling like a piece of crap again. Now I gotta go get my house back or lose it from being public housing. She lied on me. Jesus What's your name? took my name's Phil took Barbaros. I'm Barbaros the sinner. It took me 43 years to get off the drugs. I drank two beers last night. I've been a year sober from methadone program on Langley Road. Thank you all for loving me. I'd love to share my whole world. They won't make my video because it's too graphic. I'm trying to show people all the issues, their solutions, but they say I'm crazy and this and that. I got to go a little further. Well, I'm listen, Phil, one, one second. Thanks for having Listen, me. church, I believe that there are other Phillips in this room. I know there are other Barabbases in this room. Those of you that need to recognize as Philip was willing to do this morning, I need to give my life to Christ. And I want to encourage you, you could come forward during this last song and do that this morning. Now listen, one other, one other thing. Maybe some of you, you've given your life to Christ and you need to be obedient now in baptism. That you need to say, you know what, I've given my life to Christ, but I've been afraid to confess it with my mouth. I haven't wanted anyone to know about it, and I haven't been willing to get into the tank and to, to be immersed in the water and to die to self and to come up in newness of life. And we can baptize you this morning. We can baptize you next week if you want to wait. But we have all the stuff you need. We got clothes, we got flip-flops, we got whatever you need. Um, let me pray. Let's sing this song. And feel free, I encourage you, choose Jesus the Messiah. God, I am so thankful for you this morning and the work you're doing in our lives and throughout this Glen Burnie area in the hearts and lives of our community. I pray right now for that one person who, who's still sitting in their chair and they know they need to choose you, but they're just afraid to, to stand up, God. I pray that you would embolden them, give them the courage right now to stand up and to come forward and to pray with one of our prayer team leaders and to give their life to you and to choose to follow you. And for those that need to choose baptism, God, I pray that you would give them the courage to come forward and make a decision to be obedient to you in baptism. God, we worship you now through this song. We pray this in Jesus' name.